Hey everybody, welcome back uh, this week. I'm Will Fisher. I'm teaching prototyping and mechanical engineering, and I am excited that you guys are back for week four. This week is fluids and thermodynamics, which is going to be super awesome. And I want to get you guys jazzed for that. Um, just a little bit up here at the front with a video. So I'm going to show you this one. This is from Smarter Every Day. He's a really cool YouTuber. You should check out if you get the chance. But this is just him nerding out about... Uh, about some laminar flow jets at the Detroit airport. So uh, you can see these around uh, places besides that, but we're gonna talk about laminar flow a little bit today. So uh, anyway, glad you're here. Um, we'll just cruise right in. We got a lot to talk about today. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, we're gonna move pretty quickly uh, and I'll talk a little bit about all this stuff. So I'm gonna introduce fluids and thermodynamics um, and then we'll go into fluids and then thermodynamics. And then we'll talk about all the practical and applicable stuff that you guys might be interested in after that. So uh, why are fluids and thermo typically taught together? And this is actually common. It's not just me being crazy here, um, though I am still a little crazy. Um, but thermo in thermodynamics in stationary bodies is relatively well known. Uh, it's pretty easily mapped mathematically. Um, the equations all exist and have solutions. And so it's not that exciting a thing to really uh, think about so much. But fluids really complicate thermodynamics um, in really fun and exciting ways if you love math. Uh, and, and actually in a lot of practical ways, even if you aren't so keen on math. But a lot of them, uh, both of them have a lot of the same um, components showing up from both places. So things like temperature and pressure, which we will talk about at length, heat is a really important part of fluids as much as it is uh, about thermo. So the applications also tend to overlap. Um, if you are trying to cool something, you need to know about how fluids are going to move around it. And if you're trying to move fluids from place A to place B, thermodynamics really matters also. So we're gonna talk about all of that sort of stuff. I do wanna give a bit of a caveat today um, I know in the last couple of weeks, we've been a little bit more on the practical side of the knowledge, things that, that I have picked up from my years of being an engineer. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more on theory than we have. So the balance is different. We will still talk practical, I promise. And don't, uh, don't forget the theory that we've learned in previous weeks, because uh, that stuff is really uh, important as well. So um, yeah, glad you guys are here. Uh, let's jump in with a couple of definitions. A fluid, broadly speaking, is any material that conforms to its container. Um, and so the difference between gases and liquids are, by definition, um, a gas will expand fully into a container, whereas a liquid will not necessarily. Um, and so the practical applications are, there's, there's two real big differences in the way you interact with these things. A liquid is typically in engineering world thought of as incompressible. And what that means is that if you have liquid in a, a container that does not yield, you cannot compress it past its current volume. Um, and, and now technically, according to physics, it's not exactly accurate, but from an engineering standpoint, it tends to be useful in that definition. It's also something where all fluids have some viscosity, um, but you really, you need to pay attention to the viscous the viscosity of a liquid. Whereas with a gas, yes, it technically has a viscosity and that's really important for things like drag in an aerodynamic application, but you sometimes don't think of it quite as much when you're doing the numbers side of things or even when you're doing engineering. Um, and, and I'll explain some applications of why those things are kind of different as we get further into it. Gas, unlike liquid, is compressible. Uh, if I take a syringe and I cap the end, I can still press it a little bit, kind of like an air spring, which is another kind of similar idea. Cool, uh, let's keep cruising on. I wanna talk about some terms and properties here. Um, I'm showing this image on the right I'm particularly fond of. I took that photo. That's me on a tour of a decommissioned nuclear power plant, East Germany's Pride, uh, which was super cool. That's not the name of the power plant, but it was a big, thing back in the 1960s when it was built. It was super cool. And you should absolutely go and take the tour if you're anywhere close. Um, cool, anyway, that aside, let's jump into our terms and properties. So um, pressure is a property of a gas typically, and it is defined as force per area that it exerts on its container. Um, and that's an important thing, but it has a lot of ramifications um, as we'll talk about when we get into the mathier side of things. And um, 
it's kind of thought of as kind of like the primary property of your gas and of your liquid as well. It's important um, because it will take the pressure of whatever system it's in. Temperature is a material property. Technically in physics, there's a much uh, more extensive definition of what temperature is, but from an engineering standpoint, we're mostly going to think of it as a fundamental property of the material itself, right? So yes, it has to do with the excitement in the atoms and that sort of stuff, but, but what I really care about is, is my water uh, four degrees or is it 25 degrees? That's really important in my application potentially. Heat on the other hand is kind of a measure of the thermal energy within a material. And every material that's above absolute zero has some amount of energy in it. And what's really important from an engineering standpoint isn't the amount of heat that's already in a thing, but the amount that it's going to change over the course of a process. So with respect to pressure, temperature, heat, all of these things were mostly interested in the change from an initial state to an end state, right? And that's true because let's say we've got, we're cooling a circuit board application. We need to think about, okay, so we're putting a bunch of electricity into this thing. It's doing something, but it's producing heat from all the resistance. We want to meaningfully remove that heat. So we're starting with some amount of heat flowing in and we want to successfully flow that same amount of heat out, um, maybe even greater, and that would cause potentially cooling, which would be great. Um, the next term we want to talk about is volume. And volume is much more useful when you're talking about gases. For the simple fact of the matter is, is that liquid doesn't compress. And so if you have a closed system, the volume doesn't change. But with gas, it can. And you may um, have purposefully designed systems that expand to gas and then compress it and go back and forth in a cycle. And that's useful in a lot of different cycles that's used in power generation and refrigeration and in your internal combustion engine and in your jet engine, all over the place. So volume does matter just much more with gases than it does with liquids. Uh, entropy is a fun one. People often quote uh, the law of thermodynamics that, that is always increasing. That's true in a universal scale but within the context of a specific system, um, we can change entropy. And that has really fun applications, um, again, in those cycles where we're expanding and compressing things back and forth to achieve useful byproducts. Um, and that's, that's true also, like if you think of a deck of cards, if I take the deck out of, out of the pack and I scatter it in the room, I have increased its entropy. But I can also go and collect those cards, reorder them in the order that they came in, put them back in the pack, and I have decreased entropy. Um, by the time the universe is all burnt out and dead, those cards will be long gone and even the molecules within them will have lapsed into the inevitable heat death of the universe. But don't get caught up on that, it's depressing. Um, enthalpy is a, is a measure that is um, a derived property and it's a, simply a convenient way of thinking about the amount of available work you can get out of a material. So you check in a table the enthalpy values of steam as you go from high pressure steam to low pressure steam as you're expanding through a turbine. And that tells you how much work you can expect to get from that turbine in terms of the rotational energy to say generate power um, or thrust in a jet engine, something like that. Um, and then you know you have some efficiency in there and that sort of stuff. But if you're designing a power plant, which gosh, I sure hope you at home hobbyists are thinking about, um, then you'll, you'll use a lot of enthalpy. Otherwise in your day-to-day -day applications, you may not use it all that much. Viscosity is a really important one. Um, this one's more applicable to liquids than it is with gases. But if you're pumping and piping through a system, viscosity is gonna be kind of how you would think of electrical resistance in a circuit. Um, and so you can do things to decrease viscosity, like diluting with a low, lower viscosity liquid. Um, and it's also temperature dependent. So if you're finding, let's say you're piping around glycerin, glycerin is one that is highly temperature dependent viscosity. So as you heat it up, it gets much more, uh, much less viscous or inviscid, which is the opposite of viscous. Um, and as you cool it down, it just becomes sludge. Molasses is like that too. Uh, sugar solutions, if you're doing food stuff, that sort of thing. Okay. Cool, that's our introduction, that's our glossary of terms. So when I go back to those terms, now you know what we're talking about. Let's jump into the real fun stuff that is fluid dynamics, and that's fluids moving around. 
Um, here's a fun picture um, that I grabbed when I Google image searched fluid dynamics. I think it's a car and somebody's computationally modeled a thing. Computational modeling has come a long way since I learned about it um, in the mid 2000s. Um, you can now find off the shelf packages, including like Fusion 360 has some fluid dynamics packages, which is super cool because it's available even um, kind of at the hobbyist level and there's a lot of open source software out there that does that. I'm not going to talk about the modeling software as much because that's just not my specialty. Um, I am going to talk about the big three when it comes to fluids, which is pressure, volume, and temperature. I've already introduced them a little bit, but we're going to get a touch in more into detail on that. I'm going to talk about flow field diagrams, which you will see kind of as the basis of your fluid dynamics. We'll talk about some of the fundamentals of fluids, things like the no-slip condition, uh, which is really important. Laminar and turbulent flow and how they're different. Uh, how those things become drag and why that's important in your aerodynamic applications. We'll talk about uh, briefly about conservation of mass and energy, how that impacts your fluids in circuits. Uh, the Bernoulli effect, Bernoulli principle as it's called. And then we'll kind of touch very briefly on lift and why it works because it's super cool. Um, all right, let's dive in. Uh, we'll start with pressure. Uh, pressure, as I said before, is force per area. It's measured in pascals as the common SI unit. Um, it's also measured in bar, which is very, very similar to one atmosphere. Um, they're quite close. Uh, tor, which is a measurement of uh, typically used more often in vacuum than it is in pressurized applications. And in the English unit side of things, it's the pound per square inch, the PSI. Um, Sometimes if you have very high pressures, it's noted in kilopounds per square inch as KSI. Um, and these units can go up uh, as you would expect with uh, the SI units. Kilopascals is a, kind of a more useful uh, measurement for pressures that are in the kind of atmospheric range. So in your tires for your bike, for instance. When you're designing for pressure, uh, cylinders and spheres are great. You want to avoid corners. And the reason for that is um, nature uh, uh, deals with pressure by maximizing volume per total surface area. And the highest ratio of surface area, the lowest ratio of surface area to volume is a sphere. And that's why you see uh, common in arthropods, like the little ladybug I got over there, um, and water droplets. You see spheres all the time. Cylinders are also common in nature. If you think about things like trees um, and reeds, those things come in cylinders for much the same reason. Um, you're optimizing that surface area to volume ratio. And the same, you want to do the same thing in your designs when you're accommodating high pressure. Um, it's not as important with low pressure, though it is still important because atmospheric pressure is enough that it'll implode stuff if you get it wrong. So uh, cylinders uh, particularly rounded end cylinders, like if you think of train cars that, that transport liquids, you see that shape a lot in nature or in engineered things because that does a nice job of avoiding corners. You also see it in compressed gas tanks like you're seeing on the screen there. Those are oxygen tanks. Those are commonly held um, at like, you know, 50 times, 50 atmospheres, right? Like a ton of pressure inside those and they're fine, totally okay. Generally speaking, when you're designing, uh, the maximum vacuum you can ever get to is one atmosphere, right? Or one bar. Simply put, atmosphere as you think of it right now is one atmosphere if you're at roughly sea level. It's a little less than that if you're up in Denver or higher up. Um, also, it's probably cold where you are. Um, but, uh, but generally speaking, pressure, there is no upper limit on pressure. The lower limit is absolute vacuum, which much like absolute zero in the temperature scale um, exists in kind of a theoretical level, but uh, you can't actually get there. And that's a fun conversation. Maybe somebody will ask me about in Q&A because <laughs> um, crazy things happen as you get close, um, just like temperature. Um, but high pressure keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And you can get this with like hydrostatic pressure in the oceans. Um, and there is actually some point at which the pressure is sufficiently high in the oceans that steel floats. There's a neutral buoyancy for solid steel bricks, which is kind of mind blowing to think about, but that does exist on our planet here. So cool. Um, when you're measuring vacuum, unlike uh, higher pressure systems, a lot of times you use Millitor um, for kind of normal vacuum applications. Microtor would get you into high vacuum applications. And if you're getting into ultra high vac where things get really weird, you talk about mean free path. And what that refers to is how far an individual gas molecule uh, will move before it encounters an another 
gas molecule and bumps into it. Because at a, at a molecular scale, at an atomic scale, gas is things moving and bumping into each other randomly. So if you think about mean free path and atmospheric conditions here on Earth, that tends to be um, on the order of, I think, about 100 nanometers. Whereas in space, your mean free path could be uh, like in, in low Earth orbit, your mean free path is on the order of kilometers. So like hugely different, but also really important to think about uh, anyway. Cool. Let's talk about volume a little bit. I have uh, some syringes shown up there. I'm sorry if that is a phobia of yours, but they are commonly used in fluid applications to measure volumes. And the nice thing about that cylinder plunger uh, contraption, um, you get that in pistons as well. And I'll talk um, a little bit about um, hydraulics and pneumatics. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna talk about it here because I don't think I have specific slides for it later, which is a bit of a glaring omission. Um, volume is measured in liters, milliliters, cubic centimeters, um, and ounces, I guess, in English units. But even most engineers um, in the United States will still use liters, milliliters, cubic centimeters, instead of cubic inches, um, ounces, and so on. I guess it would be cubic inches. Gross. Ugh. Um, but yeah, commonly it's, it's now SI units pretty much dominate worldwide. Um, syringes are nice for dosing. You can also pump with them. Um, and cylinders are kind of an interesting thing. Those are variable volume, like uh, pneumatic cylinders, hydraulic cylinders are piston driven systems. And uh, you get some interesting trade-offs. The lower viscosity of gas means it moves much more quickly into and out of the piston. So if you have an application that, that needs high speed, pneumatics are awesome if you don't need that much strength. Hydraulics, because they're incompressible, can move more slowly, but with unreasonable amounts of strength. In fact, some of the highest pressures we can achieve as humans are hydraulic pressures, um, which is crazy. Um, so it depends on how you're designing, which one you choose. Almost all of the applications I've needed, I haven't needed a whole lot of strength. And so I've used pneumatics. Pneumatics are also just generally way easier to deal with because you can use them from an air compressor rather than having to have a hydraulic pump, which can be a real pain. Um, you also sometimes see in systems where you're going to have varying volumes that you have uh, bellows systems like the one I've shown here to accommodate changes in volume. You can also use bladders and balloons for that. Those aren't commonly used in engineering because their behavior is a little bit more difficult to predict. Um, sometimes you see them in medical applications for things like expanding stents. Uh, temperature is an inherent property. Here's a picture of Berlin from earlier this week uh, when the canals have frozen solid. Um, we'll talk about freezing in a little while, um, but it's most commonly measured in SI units in Celsius, uh, in English units in Fahrenheit, but there are absolute units of measure for temperature, and this is important in a second when we talk about thermodynamics, and those are Kelvin, which is uh, 273.15 degrees Celsius less than Celsius scale, um, and Rankine, which is 459 Fahrenheit colder than zero Fahrenheit. And those are absolute scales um, for those things. And those are necessary in some of our thermodynamic applications we'll talk about later. Rankine are so rarely used uh, that you practically don't even know them. They're basically trivia. Um, temperature is typically changed by heat flowing into or out of something. Um, however, if you have a chemical reaction that can that creates heat within a thing. So you, may, you might have kind of perfectly insulated thing where you have an exothermic reaction that will increase the temperature within a, a confined space, even if you have perfect insulation. Um, and endothermic and exothermic refer to the temperature flow into a thing, um, whereas heat transfer in and out has other things. Um, temperature also determines the speed of sound in a gas. You might think it's pressure, haha, -ha, nope, it's not. It's how fast those little molecules are zipping around that allows them uh, to bump into others. Pressure has a minor effect, but it's mostly temperature. Uh, the speed of sound decreases as you go higher in altitude because the temperature does as well. Okay, these big three react to each other in a known mathematical way. So what I've shown here on the screen is the ideal gas law. Um, and this one is useful basically for gases on a wide spectrum. And uh, the reason we don't use this um, for liquids is because uh, they're incompressible and so it doesn't really apply. This is still really useful for a lot of applications that you'll see in engineering because you can do a little bit of algebra to go a long way. Now, assuming we've got a closed system, meaning the amount stays constant and R is the gas constant, 
So that stays constant. We can do a little bit of thing, which means delta, meaning the change in PV is equal to the change in T. So a little bit more algebra means we can arrive at this, which is a generalized form of Boyle's law and Charles law and one other, I think, but I don't remember the names. And this is really useful because it lets us look at how things are gonna change. Let's go back a little bit to where I was talking about my, my syringe that I've capped and pulled open and closed. I, uh, I would stand up if I weren't tethered. Oh, I've got a long enough tether. My syringe right here. I forgot to pick it up, but conveniently it's on a shelf. I'm organized. Okay, so if I let a little bit of air into my syringe here, I can compress it and I can pull it. And what happens in there is that I'm changing my volume, but my pressure increases or decreases by the same amount, by the same amount because my temperature is relatively the same. Um, so I can push this in here and my pressure is going up. If I half my volume, my pressure is doubling, right? And I'm, that's just this, the same math here, assuming a constant temperature. Now I can do some really fun things if I'm using those three things together, like a refrigeration cycle, which is really neat. So I can pressurize a thing and then change the temperature around and, and get some interesting things out that way. So it's a, a useful thing to know the mathematical relationship. And this is basically the most complicated math we'll get into today. So whew, done with it. I'm gonna talk about flow fields. When you are learning engineering, a lot of times you see uh, flow in a specific situation. And the way you can kind of think about this is uh, how, how flow goes through a thing. And those, those vectors that you see in the middle of this uh, right here, um, that's showing that I've got my highest velocity in the center of this is a pipe flow, probably this uh, a viscous pipe flow. So this is water flowing through a pipe, for instance, will have its highest velocity in the middle and it will have zero velocity in the side. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. Similarly, if I have a liquid flowing past a cylinder or a sphere, I'm going to get this shape right here where I have this right here and I have higher velocity over here. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple of slides, but I just want to get you accustomed to seeing these uh, flow fields because they are a necessary part of how you communicate and have diagrams of fluids. The no slip condition is what we saw in the previous uh, in the previous slide on both of those surfaces. So within the pipe here and along the edge of that sphere, you, you'll see that there is no movement of the fluid in contact. And that is um, a fundamental of physics. And I'll show a video here in a second. Fluid in contact with a surface does not move with respect to the surface right, a solid surface. Um, and so what that means is, uh, if I have the surface of an, an airfoil or something like that, the gas right up next to it, like, you know, literally like atomically there is absolutely fixed with respect to that solid surface. And that is why you end up with drag, even in, because you have minor amounts of viscosity, even in a gas, you end up with this drag. That goes up like crazy in something like a nautical application where you have much higher viscosity. Um, and so now it's movie time. So we're gonna head to the next one here, uh, which is pretty cool. So this is demonstrating the no slip condition. And what you're seeing here is they've got a dye and a gas right up on a surface. So you can't quite see it. So you'll see as it moves up that it's got quite a flow moving across there, but the stuff that's right at the surface is hardly moving at all, right? Isn't that wild? I think this is just such a cool way to illustrate this. And you can see that they can kind of like brush it off afterwards, um, but that the flow wouldn't do it. So I think that's just a really good illustration of that. And it's something you need to think about as you're designing, because that's what leads us to think about piping and valving and that sort of stuff, which we'll get into later, but the no slip condition is really important. Cool. Uh, let's talk about laminar and turbulent flow. I'm only spending one slide on this. This is a career worth of math, actually uh, hundreds of years worth of math that kind of got us to this point. So laminar flow, um, and I'll show uh, turbulent flow, a video of turbulent flow in a second. Laminar flow is smooth, predictable, and mathematical. We have, again, like fluid, like thermodynamics and solid objects. Laminar flow, we have pretty well understood from a mathematical standpoint. It's not particularly complicated. And that's where viscous flow um, is kind of dominant. And that means that things pretty much, fluids pretty much stay in their lanes. You can get this in gases, you can get this in liquids. It doesn't matter. This is generic for fluids. And that's true. Um, 
for uh, Reynolds numbers being below a certain amount. So a Reynolds number is shown there at the bottom of, of your screen. And the Reynolds number is kind of a measure of several things coming together. Rho is density. Uh, U in this case is velocity of a, of a thing. L is character, big L is characteristic length. That's kind of the feature size of what you're flowing through. So the diameter of your pipe or um, the, si the length of your airfoil that sort of thing. And mu is uh, your kinematic uh, viscosity. So your viscosity, your density, your flow, and your, the size of your object all come together. And when you do all this math, what pops out is a unitless number, which as a fluid dynamicist, f non -dimension, dimensionless numbers are just like the greatest thing ever because you don't have to worry about units. It doesn't have to be metric or English, it doesn't matter all that stuff just disappears, which is great. Um, and for Reynolds numbers, you can determine whether or not a flow is going to be in the laminar regime, a transitional regime or a turbulent regime. So if your Reynolds number, if you're in a pipe and this varies based on geometry, but, but generally they're pretty close to these numbers, you, no matter where you are. Um, a lower Reynolds number means that you're in laminar flow. As you get to these higher numbers, you're getting kind of this inertial flow and that's as your density um, is higher than your viscosity. So you're getting, um, is really where that changes your speed. So, so kind of the inertia of stuff, your fluid moving. So it's your velocity and your density together dominate relative to your viscosity. Um, and that causes just chaos uh, because inertia is kind of things in motion are a little chaotic. So we're gonna watch a, um, a movie about this as well to show you another thing that happens in turbulent flow, which is really cool. So here, what you see is a, is a, is a, a, a square sil a square prism in a flow regime, and what you're seeing here is viscous flow in the wake of it. You actually do see a tiny little bit of laminar flow here, and then you get this like crazy twirling and mixing and coolness going on. And what happens is the chaos in there does something called vortex shedding, where it creates lower pressure on one side because of the viscous flow, and then it, it switch, switches back and forth. And you've seen this a zillion times out in the real world as flags wobbling back and forth in the wind. Um, and, uh, and, and in other places, like when you hear the behind a vehicle or, or whatever it is, that's the vortex shedding. You can even get it if you're driving on the highway behind a big truck. If you're in that flow where you kind of get your car wobbled back and forth, it's actually uh, aerodynamically speaking, there's safety ones, it's not a good idea. Um, aerodynamically speaking, you will uh, experience far less drag on your car, which is why people with tiny little cars sometimes tailgate these big 18 wheelers to, to kind of reduce their gas mileage or to improve their gas mileage. From a safety standpoint, be very careful about that. I take no responsibility, but from an aerodynamic standpoint, you're actually getting uh, reduced drag from being in that low pressure of the, the, the turbulent flow. Turbulent flow tends to be lower pressure than laminar flow, just generally speaking, in a thing, which leads us on to drag, which is another really cool uh, thing to think about. So there are two types of drag in conventional fluids. Um, you have skin drag, which is the no slip condition and viscosity. So that's kind of what I was talking about earlier. The fluid on the very surface of your object isn't moving at all with respect to the object. And so uh, the viscosity creates drag. You also have pressure drag. And you can think about this really easily. If I take a sheet of paper and try and just move it horizontally through a, a static fluid, or I have a piece of paper and I have fluid blowing over it. From physics standpoint, these are exactly the same. You're just changing your reference, whether you're on the piece of paper or whether you're in the, the static gas. Um, you will find a massive pressure difference as I move quickly through that between the front and the back. This makes sense. My molecules are getting pushed out of the way and I have a place where there aren't any molecules in this area over here is at lower pressure. And so uh, these are your two components to drag. And they, they do interesting things to each other. So for example, in basically every game of sports ball, there is some patterning on the outside of your ball. I've showed one here that's a golf ball, but it's true for tennis balls, it's true for footballs, um, it's true for baseballs with the stitches. Um, all of these things, what they do is when they encounter the flow field, they create turbulent flow. So they, they change the characteristic length in your Reynolds number to be shorter. And that means that even at the same velocity, sorry, 
um, your flow starts to go into that turbulent regime and you get what's called turbulent, a turbulent separation point. And that's a really important thing. So you can see I've shown it, I'm stealing someone else's diagram, it's shown here. But what that does is it allows uh, the, the turbulent flow to get in behind the thing much more quickly. And that reduces your pressure drag by narrowing your wake. Okay, so you can see that separation point here. So I'm getting that nice mix happening and that's improving uh, my aerodynamic capability. So a smooth golf ball will not go nearly as far as a golf ball with, with dimples on it. And that's true basically any sport where you're having an object move through the air. Um, and you see this all the time, um, like a football, uh, like an Amer <laughs> regardless of whether European football or American football, it's the same. In both cases, you have texturing on the outside of the ball that makes them go much further. I wanna talk a little bit about conservation. These are, I, I mean this in, in the sense of physics, uh, not in the sense of like conserving uh, animals, which I also approve of. Um, but conservation of mass and conservation of energy are the fundamentals uh, mathematically that you can use to basically derive everything else. And they are, um, <laughs> they get complicated depending on how you look at them. But, uh, but in this case, uh, they are important um, because a lot of times in engineering, you think of closed systems. So in a refrigeration cycle, you're taking your refrigerant, pushing it through the same loop again and again and again and again. And so what that means is that you have constant mass within the system as a whole. What that also means is that if you have flow through something, if you have a known area, like the diameter of a pipe, that you have what's called flux. And that's, flux is a term that's used often in electrical systems as well um, to, for like electrical fields and magnetic fields. The same exact thing is true in fluids. So you have an amount of fluid moving, a mass of fluid moving through a specific area to get flux. And that's something that is conserved if you have a closed system, no matter what. So you can do really easy calculations um, of like how much liquid is moving through an orifice if you have like a big pipe going to a little pipe, your material flux will be the same, assuming your pressure is the same, makes it even easier, um, but, your, but you, your material flux will be the same regardless. Um, and the same is true with energy, um, which is important if you're like inter in putting energy into a system and expecting it to come out somewhere. Okay, cool. Uh, right, like I was just saying, circulating systems mass is conserved throughout. Um, you may have things that go in that come out in a different way. So you can put work in and it can come out as heat. This is a fundamental part of uh, thermodynamics. You're always going to have some wasted energy as heat. It's sad. But if you figure out a way around that, uh, you've broken physics and congratulations. Um, I want to talk about the Bernoulli principle. That's the next one. And this is one that I find to be really counterintuitive. Like it's, it's, I still struggle with this a lot. And that is f increasing fluid velocity decreases fluid pressure. Um, and this has some really neat applications that we'll talk about in a second. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so basically all you really, you don't need to know the math part of it, but just know that this happens because it's one of the fundamental things about lift. Um, and lift is uh, just useful. Um, it's, it's a lot of fluids kind of, it's the, the pinnacle if you're going into aerodynamics. I say that's maybe not exactly the pinnacle, but yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's actually a combination of two different things. Um, it's a combination of redirecting flow and also Bernoulli's principle. And so uh, what you're seeing in that animation there, which I think is just such a good illustration of this, stolen straight from Wikipedia, um, is you see there is some fluid redirection in that the fluid is coming up at this angle and then it's going down at that angle. And what that does is um, for every action, there is an equal but opposing reaction. And so by changing the flow of the fluid, you're creating a force upward on the wing. Similarly, um, with the Bernoulli principle, you'll see that the gas moving over the top of the wing is moving much more quickly than the gas at the bottom, almost twice as fast. And the result of that is that it has a lower pressure. So now you have a higher pressure underneath the wing and a lower pressure above it. And because you have force times area, you have now a force lifting your wing up. Um, so it really is a combination of these things. And you can do experiments to show that neither one is fully dominant, 
right? You can have a wing with positive camber as it's shown here, and it will still get lift if its angle of attack is correct. That's redirection working. Or you can have something at zero angle of attack or even negative angle attack that still has, um, that still gets uh, lift because you have this zero camber here. And what I'm talking about in camber is this line from the very leading edge to the trailing edge, whether that line is flat or, po or, posi or positive or negative does weird, weird things, that chord there. Um, cool, or sorry, um, top camber and bottom camber relative to each other. Sorry, I'm mixing up some terms here. Dreadfully sorry. Um, there's some applications to all of this stuff kind of together. The pitot-static tube is used all the time. You'll see this on airplanes. If you look, there's, a, there's, always, there's usually a little thing sticking off the bottom of the wing or to the side of the cockpit. It's on every airplane uh, somewhere. Sometimes it's on the tail um, and um, sticking out of the, the, the tail. And this is how you measure your airspeed um, because you can take the pressure coming in, your forward pressure, and you can uh, take the side pressure, the vent pressure, the static pressure, um, and that, and you can subtract those two numbers. Um, and mathematically, you can solve for velocity, which is super cool. So it's taking all of these principles. Um, you can do some research on this if you're, you're still struggling with this. Um, it takes all of these kind of principles that we just talked about and has a practical application. I just wanted to show this one because I think it's a really elegant thing because uh, you can just solve it through. This is one of those moments where in fluid dynamics class, I, I at the end of the lecture, you know, the, the professor underlines a thing and does the formula and you're like, oh, that's really elegant. That's really cool. Can't imagine somebody discovered that, but they did. All right, that's all of fluids. Um, and <laughs> that's every bit of fluid dynamics. Um, you ever wanted to know. Let's move into thermodynamics so we still have some time at the end to talk about uh, design. Uh, thermodynamics, which is the movement of heat. Uh, I'm gonna break it down today into a couple of things. I'm not gonna get to combustion. I'm sorry, combustion is really cool, but it's really complicated. Um, and it's also really useful in things like jet engines and internal combustion engines, but the math uh, is not trivial. So we're gonna skip it today, sorry. We're gonna talk about the different types of heat transfer all three of those. Um, we're gonna talk about heat that does work very briefly. Um, and I, I know I sound like I'm a cop out on this, but again, that's one that's a lot of math. So I'm not talking about it too much. I'm gonna talk about state changes because those are really useful and those are practically applicable for you guys at home. Uh, I'll define and go over psychrometrics um, a little bit and some refrigeration, which kind of is an adjacent field to psychrometrics in a lot of ways. Cool. Radiation is one of the three fundamental types of heat transfer. Um, technically, it is an electromagnetic emission. It's usually in the IR spectrum, but at higher temperatures, it becomes, it, it, it lapses into the visible spectrum. And this is true um, no matter what material it is at about 450 or 500 C, things become red hot. At about 1000 C, they become white hot. Um, and past that, you have a sun, right? Which is basically this insanely hot thing that is kicking off a ton of electromagnetic emission, um, most of which is IR heat, as you think of it. Um, and uh, also a fair bit of visible, which is convenient because that's what our eyeballs see. Um, all matter emits every, every, uh, every, every bit of matter that's above absolute zero, which again, doesn't really exist in nature anywhere. Absolute zero doesn't quite exist but it does, but it doesn't, but it does. Um, all matter emits it and it flows from higher temperature to lower temperature, which is why when you're out on a sunny day, the sun, which the surface of which is, I don't know, 20,000 Kelvin, um, warms your skin, which is definitely not 20,000 Kelvin, no matter how hot you are. Um, and it does so mathematically um, at the difference in between the temperatures to the fourth. Um, and so what's important there is that your time's a really, really, really tiny number, importantly. Uh, but you don't have to worry about that because it's constant. It's important that you do those calculations with absolute units. You cannot use Celsius, you must use Kelvin. Um, and that uh, determines how all of these things interact. But, but generally speaking from an, from an applied standpoint, uh, what you need to know um, is that it is an electromagnetic emission um, and it goes from higher to lower temperatures. And uh, if it's visibly hot, then it's really too hot to touch. <laughs> Conduction is what happens within, typically within solids. And, I, and that's not strictly true, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, um, but it's 
uh, between or within solid objects is where you really think about conduction. Um, and it is, it is mathematically known what's called the heat equation, which is a big differential equation. It's scary looking and we won't get into, um, but that is kind of the foundation of heat transfer. Um, and, and what you should know about conduction is that it is in, in a steady state solution, linear with the temperature difference between two things. Um, and that's just a convenient thing to know. So as you start to start to heat things up, uh, the temperature difference uh, on like a bar, you'll get a linear distribution in steady state once it's, once it's fully heated. So you have you know cold water over here and hot water over here. Your temperature difference in between will be linear at steady state, very importantly. Cool. Convection is the fun one. This is what my master's research was in. Um, I'll talk about that at the end of the slide, um, but it's super cool. So there are two types of convection um, and both of them are conduction of uh, heat to a fluid. And it gets crazy really fast because now you have heat going into something that is also mobile on its own. Um, yeah, so um, it gets crazy. There are two types. Um, one is called natural convection, which you think of commonly as hot air rising. Um, and actually that's not quite the whole story though. I'm showing it here in the diagram. Um, and what happens is the object heats something which increases, uh, which, which lowers its density by increasing, or sorry, by decreasing its pressure. Um, and what happens is gravity then displaces it because there's heavier air somewhere else that forces it up. And this you see in all fluids, liquids, gases, so on, because there is some density change even in incompressible fluids. And that causes that, uh, that flow and the replenishment flow. The same thing happens in reverse. If you have a cold object and you've probably seen this, if you ever watch a space shuttle launch or a, a rocket launch, when the engines are at cryogenic temperatures, you see steam condensing and, and moving down um, because, it's, because it's colder and more dense and so it drops. Right, that's natural convection. Um, and my master's research was about this. So I did my master's research at NASA Langley um, about trying to model what happens in microgravity. So if you're in orbit and you're inside of a pressurized thing like the International Space Station, there is no real up. Where does your hot air go? It doesn't, it just sticks around and does all sorts of goofy things, which is why things like cameras overheat when they're in orbit. Uh, fun fact. Anyway, thing you probably had never really thought about, but is actually super cool. Um, Force convection is natural convection's sibling. Um, and it's what happens if you are have your hot piece of pizza and you blow over the top. You are forcing air over the top, cooler air than the pizza, and you get much, much, much greater efficiency at the heat transfer to that liquid, or sorry, to that fluid uh, in, in that thing. Uh, the math on this gets just nutty really fast. But like I said, we fluid dynamicists uh, absolutely love our dimensionless numbers. And so uh, there are a whole bunch of different ones, Rayleigh number, Prandtl number, Nusselt number. All of these predict when you move from force to natural convection uh, and all sorts of other crazy stuff to get that out. Um, turns out this is a pretty complicated system. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it gets, it gets crazy really fast, but it's really interesting and has a lot of practical applications. <laughs> hey, hey, there's the slide for that. Um, so one of the things when you're designing specifically to increase convective heat transfer is you want to increase your surface area, right? So you're going the opposite direction of nature in the surface area to volume ratio, but you do actually see this in nature some. Ears are a great example of this. That's your body's, uh, that's your body's cooling fins, um, which you see like elephants have really giant ears and that's what lets them deal with very hot temperatures um, where they're typically found. Uh, we humans do a really good job of this. Um, and uh, that's because we can divert a lot of blood flow into places that have very high surface area, notably our ears and our nose, which means if it's cold outside, cover your ears, cover your nose. Neat. Um, you can do this if you have pipes and you need to get a lot of convection out of it by creating multiple loops of a thing. Um, in particular, if, even if you have very successful convection off of your pipes, if you have pipes that are made of an insulating material, which I'll talk about in a, in a second when I talk about pipes, um, you may 
uh, you may not get the advantages from that. Um, typically, uh, well, always forced convection is going to be more effective than natural convection. So you have a heat sink shown here that's relying on natural convection. Toss a fan on that sucker, all of a sudden your convection gets way better. Awesome. Um, ideally, you want to set up to go alongside your natural convective flow with your forced convection. So if you have vertical fins, um, pipe your air up, right? So you get more in as you do. Don't counteract your flow. That's a pain. You don't want to do that. So anticipate your flow direction and work alongside it. Heat exchangers. Uh, here's where you have two fluids and something conductive in between them, but they are not mixing with each other, right? Um, the most efficient way to do this, so there's a bunch of different types of heat exchangers. Sometimes you have a bunch of tubes going through a shell, uh, which is kind of shown there. You can get cross and counter flow. You see this most commonly in radiators for heating uh, or in your car radiator where you're trying to get heat out into the environment as that's caused from the combustion. You want to get that out into the environment really quickly. The most efficient way to do this is with counter current flow or some combination of counter current and cross flow. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that lets you get, um, and why, by counter current, I mean uh, your, uh, let's see, I, your flows, your heat goes in opposite places. So your coldest and your hottest are matched up on both sides. Heat that does work. Um, this is where you take that enthalpy, your product of pressure and volume um, to create work. This is a big turbine. You can tell because there's a normal sized human on one side um, and that turbine is ginormous. I don't know if that could be from a jet turbine, but I think it's more likely probably from power generation looking at it, it's my guess, but I don't know. Um, you can use combustion, which converts uh, chemical potential energy into thermodynamic energy by virtue of expanding a gas. Um, and you see this in auto and diesel cycles. That's those are the mathematical terms for what's going on inside your engine, um, whether it's a diesel engine or a kind of a conventional gasoline internal combustion engine. Those are the mathematical things that underlie those um, by using chemical combustion to do that. I know I said I wasn't going to talk about chemical or combustion, but there I did it. Um, turbines uh, typically follow the Rankine cycle. That's how kind of how efficient they can be. Um, and they can be extremely efficient, um, like upwards of 98% efficiency. Um, but you typically see them most often in an industrial scale. It would be hard to make a very efficient turbine um, at kind of a smaller scale. A lot of times because you're using things like superheated steam and that stuff uh, will corrode basically anything. State changes are really useful uh, for you at home. Um, and you can use them because they maintain temperatures for, with, with a lot of heat input. And uh, uh, the reason that I've got that chart on there that you're seeing on the right-hand side is because as you go through a state change, your temperature stays static. And this is really, really useful. Um, like if you need to cool a lot of stuff, ice water is really convenient. The water gets you in adjacent to your surface and the ice takes a lot of energy to melt and turn into liquid water, even though it stays at that exact same temperature, zero C if you're at standard temperature and pressure. It is a little bit pressure dependent, particularly as you're going between liquid and gas. Um, so like I can put water into my syringe and I can boil it by pulling a whole, by lowering the pressure a whole lot, uh, even though I'm still at, you know, I don't know, in this room, it's probably 17 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Sweater does not work for 17 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is pressure dependent, but if you're assuming relatively constant atmospheric pressure, which you could typically do in something that is at ambient pressure, then you can very accurately know that your state change is happening at a specific point, which is really easy if you wanna have temperature maintained at a specific point. And you can change where your state changes happen by mixing things. So if I want my state change from, from uh, my melting state change or my melting freezing state change to be below zero degrees Celsius, I can get that by diluting it with say ethanol, so conventional alcohol or with sugar. Um, and you can play around with these things. For example, uh, if you wanna make ice cream, uh, you have to get, if your sugar content goes up, you may have to change your, your other, other things, your water content to make sure you still freeze properly. Anyway. Very interesting things, ice cream. Everybody loves ice cream. Uh, if you need to get things cold, refrigeration is a really good way to do it. 
Um, for the practical applications, you can usually think of a, a refrigeration unit as a heat pump. It takes heat from one place and expels it to another. Um, and this is true of your refrigerator. It's true of your air conditioning systems. It's true of, um, of all manner of refrigeration systems. And that's true, not just, so there's two different ways conventionally that it's done. Almost everything you see out there in the real world, which is a very efficient way to do it, uses the Carnot cycle where you compress a thing, take the heat out of it, expand it, and it cools off again. Um, and you do some forced convection over your uh, heat exchangers to get that out into a thing. So your refrigerator at home almost certainly is this thing. There's another way to do it uh, using what's called a thermoelectric effect, which I think is the Seebeck effect, if I remember correctly. And you can get these little tiny uh, little chips and you pipe a bunch of voltage into them and one side gets cold and the other side gets hot. You reverse the voltage and the same thing goes the other direction. You can also generate voltage from them. They're really inefficient. Um, so you might pipe uh, you know, 100 watts into one of these little things and you're only cooling like 15 watts. Um, so I would not use one to like do anything more than like cool, maybe a processing unit, something like that, you could do pretty efficiently though, but I wouldn't try to like do a state change. We tried to freeze ice for one of our cocktail robots. Uh, we put 600 watts into one of these coolers and we froze a piece of ice about the size of my pinky. Um, and it took us about 45 seconds, which is quick for freezing, but like that is a lot of juice going in there uh, for not much effect. Um, yeah, but your high efficiency stuff is much more bulky and it creates noise, whereas uh, your thermoelectric stuff is literally silent. There's no moving parts. Cool, moving right along. Oh yeah, Peltier, yep, correct. Um, psychrometrics is the study of gas and vapor mixtures. So um, you always have some, and this is mostly used in climate control. So for your air conditioning systems, and I'm just touching briefly on this, because again, this is a, like a PhD level topic. Um, and so it's, it's, what, it's, it's what gives that your temperature feel. Um, you as a human are coated in moisture. Uh, your skin creates moisture. And what that, that does interesting things because it tends to evaporate uh, in environments that are less than 100% moisture or, or rather where you're above the dew point. Um, so things, you know, where your skin is, a, anyway. Um, so that's how, you sense, uh, that's how you sense temperature. And so there are several factors in your psychrometrics, uh, dew point, wet bulb temperature, which is what happens if you put a, basically a wet sock around the bottom of a thermometer and blow air over it. Does your th temperature go down? It does, okay, your wet bulb temperature is lower. Um, and humidity, which again, this is why Berlin, when it's 80% you know, humidity and uh, two degrees Celsius and windy feels way colder than Chicago does when it's minus 20 degrees and 20% humidity. I have lived in both places and I assure you Berlin feels colder despite the fact that Chicago is way colder. Um, yeah, cool. That's thermodynamics in very quick. Now we're going to talk about resources for design and we're going to try and do it in uh, seven minutes. Seebeck effect is, oh, you're right. Seebeck effect is thermocouples. Oh, so close. All right, resources for design, me with a goofy face, as always. Uh, we already talked about pressure vessels, basically spheres and cylinders is your dream. Uh, so we'll just jump into piping, pumps, and valves. Piping, when you're designing, when you're, probably the first thing you choose when you do piping is diameter. Um, if you are handling, uh, well, all fluids have viscosity, but if you're handling a liquid, uh, your diameter has a big, big, big deal on how much head loss you get. And that's the pressure required to pipe something through a thing. And you can get an intuitive sense for this as you take a, a soda straw and try and suck water through it. Um, if you have a very, very long soda straw, like you remember those like crazy cool, neat shaped straws that you maybe had as a kid, I did. Um, I mean, you try and pull a milkshake through one of those, it ain't happening. Um, you're gonna be there, your brains are gonna end up inside the straw rather than the milkshake. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so a higher, a larger diameter makes it much easier to go through there. Sorry, I'm speaking fast. You also want to think about your material in your, um, in your piping. <coughs> Weight is important. Thermal conductivity is important if you're going to be making your own heat exchanger. 
Um, if you need things to stay insulated, plastic is great. Uh, if you need things to stay or to cool off quickly, like you're running, you're kind of making your own heat exchanger system, then you metal is much, much, much better. In that case, I would go with copper because it's really easy to form once it's already a tube um, and uh, it is highly thermally conductive. So you can kind of just assume that it's going to do a good job there. You see this a lot of times in your conventional heat exchangers. They are often made of copper. Um, you do want to take a, take a look at galvanic corrosion, which I talked about a bunch in the materials uh, presentation in, in uh, week two. And that's when you have two dissimilar metals in dry electrical contact with each other in a, in a solution, in a water-containing solution. And that will cause, basically, you create a tiny little battery and that um, electroplates part of it, or I guess it goes into solution and corrodes heavily the other part of it, which is bad news bears. You don't want that. Uh, you're also going to choose whether you want rigid or flexible. Um, piping and tubing are both kind of semantically, I kind of use them interchangeably, but realistically, maybe there's a difference. I don't know. Um, but uh, rigid and flexible are important. If you have something uh, that's going to need to be in a static place, then uh, I would definitely uh, have a rigid pipe. Uh, connection types, uh, I just want to go over some of my favorites. Uh, what you're seeing here is a push to connect. And these are really nice, particularly for pneumatic systems. Uh, they hold pretty good pressure, not perfect, but with pneumatic systems, you're gonna be able to get more air. With water or liquid systems, um, hydraulic systems, uh, your high pressures are gonna struggle a little bit here. They're nice because they're easy to replace flexible tubing in and out of. On the other hand here, end over here, ooh, uh, you have uh, a pipe thread and pipe threads are interesting because they're tapered. And what that means is as they lock into themselves, they, they seal because the threads get bigger, bigger, bigger as you thread them in. And that pushes out deforming the material slightly. Um, you do typically want to use with pipe thread um, some thread tape and that's not an adhesive tape. It's a thin layer of Teflon that you coat around three, four, five revolutions. And then when you thread it in, um, it deforms in and gets a very, very good seal. And pipe systems can have can handle really, really high, silly high pressures in fun ways. Um, this thing right here that you're looking at is what's called a barb. You use these with, with tubes and with hose. Um, flexible things fit over that, and then you get a seal as they deform back into it. I use those frequently as well. They're really convenient. I do want to go over, I'm going to brand name drop here, Swage Lock. You can get off brand as well of the same thing. And what this does is it has a taper that fits into a socket. And then when the tube is cranked down against it, it deforms a ferrule into the tube and into the taper simultaneously. And these systems can handle, gosh, a ton of pressure, um, hundreds of bar um, when they're properly assembled. Um, and they're really nice because they're pretty easy to take apart as well. Um, they don't ever hold quite as much pressure after the first time, but you can still get very high pressures um, and have something that comes apart easily and goes back together. You need to have pretty rigid tubing to use them. You can't use super floppy stuff because it doesn't seal. Um, but, uh, but, but with like stainless steel tubing and swage lock, mm, what a beautiful thing. I do want to talk about pumps. Ooh, got to go real fast. I'm going to go into Q&A time. I'm sorry, guys. Um, We'll talk about pump curves, types of pumps. I'm breaking them into low viscosity and high viscosity pumps, which is an utterly arbitrary thing. Also, you can use any of them for low or high viscosity thing, but whatever. Um, here, I've got a syringe pump shown on the screen. Basically, all that is is a motor that pushes a syringe. It's great for closed systems where you need to have very precise dosing um, or a very known amount of material going. There's also a bladder's bellows uh, solenoid diaphragms where a solenoid will push a thing, um, which my 1970 Chevelle back in Texas has, where it pulls a vacuum to create everything. Um, and there's a, just a huge variety of really cool specialty vacuum pumps that I could dork out about forever. We're not going to. Um, I also want to talk about head pressure because it's a pressure measurement, but it actually talks more about the piping resistance that you get in a loss. Self-priming pump simply refers to the fact that if you have uh, air in a thing and you're trying to pump a liquid, that it will pull enough air out to move liquid up a certain amount into the pump so it can start pumping with high efficiency if it has to pump an incompressible thing. Uh, pumps are always pulsatile or constant. And what that means is um, sometimes I'm delivering a pulse. So pulse, 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 pulse of pressure. Um, and sometimes I'm delivering a constant flow. If I need to get a constant flow out of a pulsatile delivery system, like a um, 
a peristaltic pump, what I can do is I can have a pressure chamber where I have some gas and mostly liquid. And as it pumps in, the gas will compress, but then it will provide a constant pressure. So you'll pressurize that gas, gas in a headspace and um, you'll get a nice smooth delivery. That's how a beer keg works. It's really, really a convenient way to get constant rate delivery from something. Cool. Uh, pump curves are um, what you see when you look up a specific pump. It'll give you, they'll give you a pump curve. And this is telling you um, a pressure amount in terms of head pressure in length, weirdly, um, versus the flow rate coming out of the pump. So you convert, you can convert your head length to pressure. Um, and you do that by Googling it. <laughs> it's dumb, but it works. Um, so this is kind of how you read one. Um, so you would design in, let's say I need uh, my, I've got my, I need a uh, 1.4 bar. Um, I need 15 meters. I'm gonna look over here on my, on my 15. I'm gonna say I need a flow rate of at least 10. Okay, that's like here-ish. Okay, so I can specify the HTM 15. And this is a manufacturer that has a variety of models. So I'll say, okay, I'm below the curve, I'm good to go. These pumps I typically use for low viscosity though they don't have to be. Um, fans, impellers, and centrifugal are things where you spin stuff around and stuff moves. A fan, you kind of understand intuitively, um, it's basically little airfoils moving around. An impeller is the same thing on a different axis, um, so you can see it down there. Um, and then a centrifugal pump flings stuff to the outsides, so you have an inlet in the center. So with an impeller pump, you have an inlet on one side and it pushes out the other side. With um, a centrifugal pump, you have an inlet in the center that comes in right here. And then it basically flings things to the outside, increasing the pressure on the outside, and you have a discharge and a direction. Part of the reason that I'm on a different computer today is so that I can get all these animations going at once. I love pumps, they're super cool. Um, you're looking at a whole bunch of different types. Uh, this one right here is called a scroll pump because it's scrolling around in a spiral. It's super neat. Uh, you see these sometimes in vacuum pumps, but they work for anything. Um, including high viscosity stuff. Um, this is a vein pump here. Um, you've got a spring in the middle there. So as this thing rotates around, it takes a high volume thing and pushes it into being a low volume thing. Here is an external gear pump where it's piping around the external sides. Here is an internal gear pump. And this one's really cool. So what it's doing is it's taking, um, it's got an inlet basically over on, he on here coming down from the top and an outlet over here, and it's just moving from one side to the other. And these are used in fuel pumps commonly in automotive applications. Uh, this one down here is a peristaltic pump. It's a piece of tubing that's being pushed by a roller. And this is about as pulsatile a pump as you can get. Um, and also the tubing wears out. However, they're real cheap to manufacture, so you can buy these as hobbyists. Um, and they're nice if you need to do precise dosing, like if you're doing um, home, like plant growing or cocktail robots or those sorts of things. These are a real cheap, nice alternative. And you can count the revolutions going in and have a very good idea of what's going out the other side. This is a diaphragm pump. You find these a lot of times also kind of at the hobbyist scale. They're really nice for pumping pretty high, like they're cheap to manufacture so you can you can get them for air pumps a lot of times for like aquariums and that sort of stuff but i've used them for a whole bunch of different applications all over the place they're a nice one valves hey cool um there are a whole bunch of different functions of valve i'm going to talk about different valve functions um this one that you see here is what's called a tesla valve um he didn't call it that but it is was invented by nikolai tesla and this is a passive check valve it's super cool because fluid can flow through it one direction really easily, and it has a lot of difficulty flowing through it the other direction. You can also get um, check valves that are passive. And what a check valve is, is it's like a diode and electric circuit. I have a drawer of them over there, which I was just reaching for. Um, so you can see one kind of right here. Um, and it allows flow to go through one direction, but not the other direction. It'll seal backwards. Uh, fun fact, your heart is basically a whole bunch of check valves. Um, where it, as it can, expands and contracts, it can only push in one direction, uh, which is cool. So a check valve, like a diode, allows flow in one direction and restricts it in the other direction. You also have on-off valves. Um, that is just is flow or not flow. Um, regulators regulate pressure output. Um, relief valves are kind of a subset of regulator and you put them in systems where you wanna make sure that you vent if you get above a certain pressure. Um, so your air compressors typically have this to make sure you don't blow up your air compressor importantly. Throttling uh, is, allows you to control the amount of flow rate 
going through. Cool. Um, so on off valves, the one you see there on the top right is a conventional ball valve. That's just a simple handle. You see these in plumbing applications all the time. They're really, really nice. You can use them to do throttling, but they don't do a very good job of it. There are better things for that. Um, and they're typically hand driven. You also see um, a solenoid valves down there and just some kind of like on off valves um, down here, toggle valves, and that's a McMaster car schematic of it. Solenoid valves are electrically controlled when they're active, typically they're open, and then they close when you de-energize them. Um, you can get them by latching, which I was asked in and asked about that this week in an email, which was great. I went and looked them up, they're really cool. Um, I haven't used them really, but they're super neat. Um, they do, solenoid valves do heat up significantly when active and they just chew up electrical power. So they're really nice for controlling short bursts of things like pneumatic movement, but they are uh, not great if you want to leave them open unless you get that by latching alternative. Uh, regulators are really cool. So basically what you have is a spring and you can dial it in and out with a, um, with a knob. Um, as you dial it in, it's higher pressure. As you pull it out, it's lower pressure. And that's because you're, you're, cre you're dialing in an amount of uh, compression that regulates the amount of flow that goes through. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty cool. And regulators also are actually a fairly effective backflow preventer, which is neat. Um, and they, they typically regulate with respect to a specific pressure. So in this case, it's atmospheric. When you're reading a regulator on a gas bottle, the left one typically is how much the pressure of the bottle is. Um, and the right one is what the output regulated pressure is. So in this case, uh, you've got bar in black and PSI in red. Um, so, um, you know, a typical gas bottle would arrive at about 250 bar, maybe 200 bar, somewhere in there. Um, and you, this is kind of how much you have left in the tank. And then this is, you tune by dialing that, that hand knob in and out um, to the pressure you want on the outside. Cool. Uh, throttling valves come in a lot of different shapes and sizes for a lot of your like big uh, airflow stuff. You see these kind of control dampers, which are kind of complicated versions of a butterfly valve a lot of times. So this is our butterfly valve over here. Um, these are typically operated, they can be operated as hand valves or electronically. Um, they're nice because they're rotational um, and they, they control how much flow goes through something. Uh, gate valve is a similar thing. It's just a thing that moves up and down. So you see a, a manually operated one there, but they are very commonly electrically actuated. Um, and then you see this one here, which is a needle valve, um, which when you thread it in, stops flow, and as you thread it out, starts flow. Uh, and that one's a swage lock as well, neat. Um, yeah, sometimes the gate valve is also called a knife valve because that thing looks like a knife coming down through the thing. Don't put your fingers inside. Whew, that's everything I went eight minutes over. I'm so dreadfully sorry. Let's go to Q and A. Um, yeah. I'll start reading through the chat. Uh, I do want to say engineering generally is about creativity. Look for those opportunities to think out the, I said to think outside the cylinder because uh, we just talked all about pressure and stuff. But uh, yeah, if, if you find stuff lying around, see if you can use it. That's how cool inventions get made. And now you know all about fluids. You can build that apparatus, uh, which I showed you last week as well and made the exact same joke about building stuff. Here I am back making the same jokes. Sorry, guys. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's, uh, let's go to q and I'm just going to start at the top of the chat, cruise my way through. 